he was a great man of the theater, a conductor of genius, a personality so fascinating that sales of his recordings topped 150 million. Even now, 10 years after his death, the demand continues unabated. And although Herbert von Karajan is no longer here to witness it, his dearest wish to bring joy to the world through music is being fulfilled. In the final 12 months of his life, the ailing 81-year-old had planned a concert tour with the Berlin Philharmonic, supervised a recording of Verdi's Ballo in Mascara, traveled to New York with the Vienna Philharmonic, organized and performed at the Salzburg Easter Festival, and prepared for the Summer Festival. With enormous commitment, he'd also forged ahead with his CD and video project. During his childhood, the Austro-Hungarian Empire still flourished. Until the outbreak of the First World War, Salzburg was both a province and a garrison town. But the glorious empire came to an end with the death of the old emperor, although the war was to continue for another two years. Afterwards came hunger, poverty and deprivation. Herbert von Karajan's family came to Salzburg when his father was appointed surgeon at the regional hospital. They lived in a townhouse right on the banks of the river Salzach. Young Herbert admired his elder brother Wolfgang, and craved the same privileges as were granted to his sibling, including music lessons. Since the boys were forbidden to play by the river which ran past the house, they used to romp about on the staircase which became their almost permanent home during Herbert's early years. Salzburg at the end of Carianne's life. Everything he saw here served as a reminder of the different stages in his life. The beautiful countryside at the foot of the Untersberg to which he often walked. Here, he built himself the cherished house in which he later died. The mountains of the surrounding area would provide him with lifelong inspiration and relaxation. He recalled how, at every stage in his life, he would return to this region. He needed nature to restore his energy. His happiest childhood memories were bound up with his parents' country house on the Grundlsee, in the Lakeland region around Bad Aussee. Karian's father adored the region where his own parents had kept a summer residence, and he dragged his children up to the peak of practically every mountain in the area. The carnival celebrations, with their strong musical traditions, held special appeal for the whole Karajan family. In his later years, he often told the story of how, at the age of six, he was on his way with his father and brother from their house on the Grundlsee to the market when they came across a Flinseren group. In the middle of the group was a fiddler, playing quite brilliantly. Flinseren are a traditional feature of carnival time. The characters portrayed by the performers are derived from the Italian Commedia dell'arte and the old English comic figure of Mary Andrew introduced to Salzburg in the 16th century by Prince Bishop Marcus Sitticus. The family stopped and listened. Then, from every side, groups of trommelweiber emerged. The task of these male drummers dressed up as women is to create a big enough din to scare the winter away. This time, however, they also managed to drown out the fiddler, the beat of their drums preventing him from playing any more.
As Carrion later recounted, he said to his father, I shall never be a fiddler. I'd sooner be a drummer. Here, he caught his first glimpses of Hugo von Hofmannsthal, Arthur Schnitzler, Sigmund Freud, Richard Strauss, and many others. Salzburg was still not much affected by the First World War. Before the end of the war, Herbert made his first appearance here in the Vienna Hall as a piano virtuoso. And while still at grammar school, he studied harmony, piano and composition at the Mozarteum under Bernhard Paumgartner, who would later be his mentor. After leaving school under the First Republic, he went to Vienna to study mechanical engineering at the city's College of Technology, but he quickly switched to music. Whenever he could, he went to the opera, taking advantage of free tickets supplied by his uncle, who was senior house manager there. Later, under Carianne's leadership, the Opera House was to experience one of the most glorious periods in its history. There were also times when Carian virtually lived at the Musikverein. He would later be appointed Conductor for Life and honorary member of the Vienna Singverein. Clemens Krauss was his most influential teacher, who made it possible for him to study percussion. Carian's first professional appointment was at the City Theatre in Ulm. The old theatre was very small, but its far-sighted musical director, Otto Schulman, immediately recognized the talent of the young man from Salzburg and cautiously entrusted him with increasingly difficult tasks. The incredible limitations with which he had to contend, both in terms of personnel and quality, taught him the values of prudence and flexibility. Carian admired the beautiful architecture of Ulm's mighty cathedral and was fascinated by the fact that during the Reformation, it was only after a public ballot that the gigantic building was allowed to be taken over by the Protestants. People still tell how he cycled doggedly around the city in order to find gifted amateurs to join the little orchestra. He even managed to incorporate an amateur quartet seamlessly into his band of musicians in order to perform Mozart, Beethoven and Strauss, and even some first attempts at the music of Gustav Mahler. Carianne occupied an attic room in the home of the only female member of the quartet and was full of praise also for her cooking. Each summer he returned to Salzburg in order to learn from the great masters of his art appearing at the festival. In those difficult days after the First World War, catering for the many international visitors was a problem and sometimes provoked hostile reactions from the local population. The much admired Max Reinhardt was the centre of attention at the festival and Bernhard Paumgartner arranged an introduction between the two men. Shortly afterwards, Carianne became musical director for Reinhardt's famous production of Faust at the Felsenreitschule, the spectacular auditorium in the shelter of the cliffs. Here, he also conducted Gluck's Orpheus and Eurydice. He admired Richard Strauss and Arturo Toscanini. I have been here somewhere in the world, when I was in the Orgel Pfeifen. I said, I can't remember it. And it goes suddenly on, it breaks its brill, it slides the partitura, it stamps on it. Und rennt weg. Zum Ausgang. Zu. Geht auf die andere Seite. Auch zu. Und jetzt etwas geschehen, was wirklich rührt war. Er hat sich in eine Ecke gestellt und hat sich geschehen. He even made a pilgrimage by bicycle to Bayreuth to hear Toscanini. When his appointment at Ulm came to an end, he endured an agonizing year out of work until he was finally offered an audition at the Aachen Opera. Many of the musicians and singers with whom he began his career here were to accompany him for much of his artistic life. In Aachen, he worked with such eminent directors as Felsenstein, and his opera performances attracted the attention of the national press. 
Here he became Germany's youngest general music director. Under his leadership, the orchestra enjoyed a remarkable rise to prominence, and the chorus was regarded as one of the finest in the land. Soon afterwards, Karajan was invited to become guest conductor in Berlin, and for the first time experienced the full force of Germany's aggressive new regime. It soon became clear that it was completely unscrupulous in achieving its aims, and no field of activity, not even culture, was immune. Then, with the approval of a large section of the population, the National Socialists annexed Austria to the German Reich. Prague came under the so-called protection of the German Reich, and Herbert von Karajan was obliged to conduct a celebratory concert in the presence of all the notables of the Reich. First Poland was invaded, and then France. At the concert held after the victory parade in Paris, on the day the surrender was signed, an indignant Herbert von Karajan was required to play the Horst Wessel song before beginning the scheduled programme. Despite the war and the climate of fear, Berlin still enjoyed an astonishingly rich musical life. Goebbels and Goering argued constantly over how things should be organised. Goering had major problems with the renowned but idiosyncratic conductor Wilhelm Furtwängler. Herbert von Karajan admired Furtwängler, but being the younger man by 23 years and appointed by the chief administrator of the Deutsche Oper, who was controlled by Goering, he was soon to become the dynamic new rival. The conflict intensified until there was no hope of reconciliation. The affair became the talk of the town. Fresh rumours abounded and two opposing camps were created. At the Staatsoper, it sometimes seemed that Karajan was trying to oust Furtwängler, and although it was all manipulated from behind the scenes, the relationship between the two conductors remained embittered until Furtwängler's death. Karajan's rise to stardom was now unstoppable. One of the most important working relationships, which was to continue until long after the end of the war, was with the director of the Schaus Spielhaus on Berlin's Schandamen Market. Eine Sache, an die ich mit besonderem Vergnügen zurückdenke, das war der, die Zauberflöte, die ich mit dem Gustav Gründgens gemacht habe. Und es wurde nämlich besonders der Barberino betont. Und er hat nicht einen Mann genommen, der Klamauk macht, sondern der ein typischer Ich würde sagen, wirklich ein typischer Österreicher war. Und es ging eigentlich auf einen Satz heraus, wo er gesagt hat, wissen Sie, ich würde sehr gerne eine Frau haben und, und alles das, aber Prüfungen, nein, das bin ich nicht. Und dieser einfach Mensch, der sich genügen lässt mit Essen und Trinken und so weiter, dagegen hob sich dann das Paar Pamina und Tamino mit umso größerem Kontrast ab, als wenn man die Weißgut hingestellt hat. Die, die Menschen werden ja eigentlich auf der Bühne immer durch die anderen gemacht. He was soon forced to realize to what extent he had become a pawn in other people's games. He allegedly joined the party in Salzburg on the 8th of April 1933, and also in Ulm in the same month. At that time, however, he was still working with Max Reinhardt, and the one situation would have precluded the other. Karajan himself claimed that he did not join in Ulm, but in Aachen in 1935, and did so in order to secure the post of general music director there. In order to make his intentions less conspicuous, his enrollment was backdated, which is also registered in his papers. While during the Third Reich he was criticized for becoming a National Socialist, not out of political conviction, but to further his career, his membership also made him the target of criticism after the war. Investigations continued until after his death. 
Meanwhile, Carian's interest was focused on an organ, brought from Byzantium to the Palatinate Chapel in Aachen in the 9th century, and which had since disappeared. The organ's enormous range was instrumental in the development of Western music. And of course, he pursued his career. In Berlin, Carian then applied for the post of music director in Dresden, and finally met Richard Strauss, who admired Carian as a conductor. Strauss approached Goebbels to seek his support for Carian, but Hitler is believed to have personally rejected his appointment. Carian found less and less to occupy his time. The world was on the way to achieving the downfall of the Third Reich. In the final year of the war, he conducted the first experimental stereo recording in Berlin. The Second World War was a catastrophe beyond imagining. Before the end of the war, he fled to Milan, ostensibly to conduct a Rossini concert at the request of the city's Radio Symphony Orchestra. But the performance never took place. The city was under siege. The German army was in disarray. Benito Mussolini was captured by partisans near his home and executed. Food could only be found on the Navilio Grande, a canal on the edge of the city, where farmers were able to smuggle in a few supplies by boat. With the aid of a British officer, Carian was able to make the arduous journey back home to Salzburg. He was deeply grieved by the brutality of his fellow human beings. The world has to change, he declared. Children especially should not be allowed to endure such conditions, he wrote at the time. The administrators of the Vienna Philharmonic invited him to give a concert in Vienna. The authorities allowed the performance to go ahead, and it remains an unforgettable event in the city's musical history. A second concert was banned by the Allied forces of occupation, and Carian's future prospects in Vienna looked bleak. His immediate future was determined by a meeting with Walter Legge, artistic director of the Columbia Record Company and founder of the London Philharmonia Orchestra. A preliminary contract was agreed, at least ensuring some income for Carian. He then spent a long time in the Vorarlberg region of Austria, taking stock of his experiences, attitudes and work. Every day he would walk for six or seven hours in the mountains, carrying his scores with him. The weather was often bad, and he would usually make for the small, sparkling lakes at the end of the Fassel Valley. Overtaken by storms, he was sometimes obliged to spend a night in the shelter of the rocks. Writing to friends in Vienna, he claimed he felt like Tannhäuser, torn between heaven and hell. Among Carian's achievements in Vienna was his first film production of a great classical work, The St. Matthew Passion by Bach. After numerous visits to the reopened Art History Museum, he decided to produce the Passion Cantata der Tour de Jesu, linking visual images with the music and contrasting the despairing realism of Cranach the Elder with the splendor of Albrecht Dürer's crucifixion. Et 
ich ihr aber wieder stunden, dass sie das hörten, sprachen sie. Wir rufen gegen Jesus. Und bald lief einer unter ihnen, nahm einen Schwamm und füllte ihn mit Essig und steckte ihn auf ein Rohr und tränkete ihn. Die anderen aber sprachen, Halt! After the ban on his performances was lifted, the quarrel with Furtwangler resumed, much of it to do with the St. Matthew Passion. Marianne spent more and more time in London and began systematically to record classical works with Walter Legge's Philharmonia Orchestra. He and his colleagues would talk late into the night. Most of the recordings were made in the Royal Albert Hall. He lived at the Savoy Hotel, where Richard Strauss had also recently stayed. It was here that Carrie-Anne received news of the revered composer's death. The very next day, in memory of his great role model, he and members of the orchestra retraced the route of Strauss's daily pre-rehearsal walk, through Hyde Park, past the Duck Pond to the National Gallery, where the composer would always stop to admire specific works of art. The paintings of Veronese, which he compared to Mozart. Tintoretto's Origin of the Milky Way, which gave him special pause for thought. but he would linger longest with the masterpieces of Caravaggio, which he associated with the slow movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. His visit would always end with Rubens' Judgment of Paris, which for him symbolized Beethoven's violin concerto. Carrion's work with the orchestra set new standards. In London, Berlin and Vienna, he continued working on Beethoven's Ninth, which was filmed on several occasions. Bleiben Sie auf dem Verhaltenen, aber natürlich mit umso mehr Ausdruck. Kann ich denn den Takt davor haben? Ja. 46. Da ist der Bruch zwischen C und F. 
Tiro, 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 Und kehren Sie wieder, wieder zum Ausdruck auf den C zurück. Es ist unten zu wichtig. Nicht? Bitte. Äh, das hätte ich schon. Vielleicht nur vergleichbar dem Vogelflug, wenn Sie sehen, und das ist eine Sache, die mich immer wieder fasziniert, zu sehen, wie eine Schar von 300 äh, Vögeln von einem gemeinsamen Willen gelenkt wird und ohne dass sichtbar ein Führer da ist, sie die Bewegungen, die sie machen, vollkommen äh, koordiniert und in größter Schönheit ausführen. Es sein, nicht Selbstzweck für einen Fotograf, äh, fotografischen Geld, sondern es soll dem Werk dienen und das ist vielleicht bei der neunten Symphonie, die äh, in dem Fall wirklich mein Schmerzenskind ist und an der ich wirklich mit ganzem Herzen hänge. Wir haben ein Jahr gedreht mit sehr vielen Schwierigkeiten, es mussten manche Dinge völlig neu erarbeitet werden. Wir haben viele Dinge gelernt, zum Beispiel das Orchester, das sich selbst ja immer wieder sieht, die Art der Intensität, wie sie eine Phrase ausspielen, weil jeder von sich aus so viel Kraft und so viel Intensität hereingeben muss, wie es bei einer Probe fast überhaupt selten vorkommen kann. Ich glaube, dass man in manchen Dingen, zum Beispiel das Ende, das ja der Chor ist, dann haben wir versucht, einen, einen, einen Weg zu zeigen, dass in der Philharmonie, die doch so gebaut ist, dass der Dirigent fast in der Mitte steht, alles, was vor ihm ist, ist eigentlich Chor. Es ist andeutungsweise 350 oder 400 Menschen. Und das gibt der ganzen Sache etwas sehr Großes als Abschluss. Ich muss sagen, es war eine besonders glückliche Zeit, und, aber sehr lang.
the ailing Wilhelm Furtwängler died on the 30th of November, 1954. Carian was invited to take his place for the Berlin Philharmonic's planned tour to America. Before leaving for the USA, Carian was appointed the orchestra's conductor for life. On arrival in New York, his interviews had to be scripted in advance. You are happy to come to the United States. I am happy. I'm happy to come to the United States. In Vienna, he was named artistic director of the Staatsoper. Whenever he reminisced about those days, he would always speak of the many problems he encountered, but also adding that this was one of the happiest periods of his life. He loved the Opera House, its wonderful orchestra and the long traditions that lay behind it, the conductor's office dating back to Gustav Mahler's day, and the applause he received there. Now remarried and the father of two daughters, he increasingly avoided social engagements, taking refuge in his house at Mauerbach in the Vienna woods and devoting what little free time he had to his family. The Austrian parliament passed a special carry-on law and an old tax inspector said of him, he has a villa but no fixed abode. Milan. After the war, he conducted in the city on numerous occasions and also began to direct productions, firstly of the German repertoire and later of Italian operas. He signed a contract with La Scala and the Vienna State Opera, providing for an exchange of singers under identical conditions of employment and for all performances to be given in the original language. This remained a bone of contention for a number of years. The new production of Puccini's La Boheme, directed by Franco Zeffirelli, started out as a scandal, but then proved to be a huge success, as the singers were cast according to their suitability for their roles, rather than for personal popularity. Marianne took the production home to Vienna, and it was the last in a series of controversial events leading to his departure after a quarrel with his new co-director. But the real reasons were different. Zum Schluss ist es einfach der tägliche Betrieb, der nicht möglich ist zu halten in der Perfektion, wie ich wollte. Das habe ich zuerst gehofft. Dann habe ich gesehen, dass es nicht durchführbar ist. Und am Ende meiner Tätigkeit bin ich drauf gekommen, dass selbst wenn es möglich wäre, es gar nicht wünschenswert wäre, weil jeden Tag Festtag verträgt niemand. He left Vienna and only the city's cabaret artists still sang about him. Karajan, bin dort. Hey, Karajan, bin da. 
But he could still laugh about it. In Salzburg, Carrie Ann became a member of the board of management of the Salzburg Festival. He was seen more and more often in the St. Sebastian Cemetery. Not because it was the eternal resting place of Mozart's father, buried side by side with Constanze Nissen and Aloysia Lange, both of whom he hated for most of his life. Carrie Ann came to visit the grave of Theophrastus Paracelsus, the revolutionary doctor, regarded as a heretic by his colleagues, but whose theories changed the whole face of medicine in the late Middle Ages. Carrie-Anne often quoted Paracelsus during this period. Was dann nicht eigentlich das Wort von dem äh, großen Paracelsus, der immer gesagt hat, die Kaiser und Könige haben mich nicht gemocht, die Hochmögenden, die Oberen, die Bürgermeister haben mich nicht gemocht und die Magistratsräte haben mich ge nicht gemocht, aber meine Kranken haben mich gemocht. Richard Strauss's Don Quixote was one of his showpieces. At one time, there was scarcely any difference between the strolling player, the doctor, and the musician, he said. A conductor must possess something of each of them, like a good doctor, who still has something of the quack about him. Even more frequently, he referred to a saying of the adolescent Richard Wagner. I have no desire to be emperor or king. I only want to be a conductor. And... When an orchestra recognizes the reasons behind its efforts, when its members no longer feel like people who must subordinate themselves in order to become a collective, Oedipal being, caught between protest and subservience, then together they can achieve something extraordinary. Yeah, that's liegt mir sehr am Herzen. Sind ein paar Dinge, zum Beispiel über die Psychologie eines Orchesters, wo nie jemand überhaupt geschrieben hat. Wie reagieren Sie? Was wollen Sie? Was? Möchten Sie im Geheimen? Was möchten Sie, wenn Sie darüber reden können? Speaking of his collaboration with the Berlin Philharmonic, he claimed, only after 25 years have we reached a point where we can talk about harmony. And when, on the occasion of the orchestra's anniversary, he was asked about his future wishes for the orchestra, he replied, to work with me for as long as possible. The whole structure of each work was laid bare and closely analysed. Nothing was allowed to sound blurred or to be changed by emotion. His aim was to make the music comprehensible to every listener through his artistry and his strict adherence to tempo. Even passion had to be vented in precise measure. He was easily offended and would never forget even the slightest display of scepticism or passive resistance. At every concert, he strove to improve. He craved ever greater success. Much of his ill health was due to continuous overexertion. While helping with the construction of his house in St. Moritz, he fell from the roof, an accident which led to the first of two serious operations for a slipped disc. From then on, he was in constant pain, but confronted these obstacles with even stronger discipline. During a rehearsal in 1978, he fell off the rostrum. A newspaper commented, it was as though the universal edifice of classical music had come crashing down. Zwölf Operationen. Das kann einen Menschen zur Raserei bringen. Und ich spüre es gar nicht. Aber es wird ihnen manches genommen, sie kriegen viel mehr dazu. Und das hat mein ganzes Leben jetzt vollkommen ausgefüllt. He played an active role in the building of two great temples of music. The architect Clemens Holzmeister designed Salzburg's Grosser Festspielhaus to carry Anne's specifications. 
It was a combination of theater and concert hall on a vast scale to match Carrie-Anne's plans for future productions. Since his time in Ulm, he could never overcome his aversion to small opera houses. The new venue opened with Richard Strauss's Rosen Cavalier, with Carrie-Anne on the rostrum. He made a special journey to London to visit the little Sir John Soane's Museum, where Richard Strauss once brought Hoffmannsthal to see the paintings by William Hogarth, which provided the model for the sets of Rosen Cavalier.
da sind wir ein bisschen wie die Japaner mit dem Kabuki. Da ist im Grunde genommen nichts Neues zu sagen. Es kann besser gesagt werden, es kann, es kann intensiver gesungen werden. Und natürlicherweise mit dem Lauf der Jahre sieht man ja immer, wo man die manche äh, Fehler gleich von vornherein dadurch ausmerzen kann, dass man den be besonderen Menschen nimmt. Äh, und da sucht man eben sehr lange und zum Schluss kristallisiert sich eben das heraus, was von vornherein schon viele Fehlerquellen ausschaltet. Aber ich muss sagen, äh, die Harmonie, in der da gearbeitet worden ist, äh, habe ich eigentlich nie mitgemacht. In the autumn of the same year, the foundation stone of Berlin's Neue Philharmonie was laid. Hans Scharoun's creation, with its bold angles and sweeping lines, reached a height of 34 meters. The auditorium takes the form of a series of concentric pentagons, with an almost matchless view from every part of the hall, the steeply raked rows of seating hanging from the walls like terraced vineyards on a hillside. It is both relaxing and inspiring, but the attention of the audience is never distracted from what is going on in the orchestra, which forms the focal point with the conductor in the center. Not for nothing did it become popularly known as Carrie-Anne's Circus. The maestro enjoyed a particularly good relationship with the architect Hans Scharoun. Later, Sharoon introduced Carian to his world-renowned colleague Mies van der Rohe, who told him about Lionel Feininger, a painter from a musical family who also thought in completely musical terms, between the natural and the abstract, who looked for the primitive image behind things, the ultimate perfect form. The artist became Carian's spiritual traveling companion as he tackled the music of Schoenberg, Berg and Webern. The result was a definitive recording. If on a clear winter night you look up at the chaos of millions of stars in the sky, but nonetheless detect order behind it, you realize that the only thing that to which it can be compared is the natural diversity of sound. The glittering firmament is also a kind of mirror image of the human brain. Contemplating the same phenomenon, Pythagoras too withdrew into the well-ordered structure of sounds. He not only wanted to bring joy to mankind, but also to relieve human suffering. That dream continues to this day. In 1967, he founded the Salzburg Easter Festival, an event tailor-made for the maestro himself. At first, he considered Geneva as a possible venue, but nowhere else were conditions so favorable as in his hometown. The Grosser Festspielhaus he had helped design stood empty at Easter. The technical facilities of the concert hall were among the finest in the world. Es hat in Strömen gegossen. Ich bin drei Stunden durch den Regen gegangen und habe mir das genau überlegt, was sind die Möglichkeiten, was sind die Folgerungen und das alles. Und dann war es fertig. Am nächsten Tag habe ich es meinen Mitarbeitern äh, dann klar gemacht, was ich will. Den meisten die haben, waren nah an einem Herzinfarkt. Das, das, das wollen sie alles riskieren. Für, so, ja, das steht mir dafür. Das, ich tue es ganz bestimmt. Und von da ab, das war die Geburt der Osterfisch, die für mich sicher eine, ein, ein besonderer Glücksfall sind. He was a man of music who insisted that it was also essential to understand at least something of staging techniques. He established a kind of alternative Bayreuth, launched with performances of Wagner's Ring Cycle. Many voices were raised against the gigantic private endeavor. Alongside his artistic activities were the symposia organized on behalf of his foundation. Numerous scientists were invited, among them Werner Heisenberg, Walter Simon, Conrad Lawrence, and many more. Carian himself was willing to act as guinea pig for experiments. Ich habe zu diesem Zweck selbst an mir einen Versuch unternommen, an einem Tag der äh, Hauptprobe mit Orchester in Siegfried, wurde an mir eine Apparatur angeschlossen, die genau dasselbe ist, mit der die Kosmonauten auf ihrem Flug zu Mond 
gesundheitlich überwacht worden sind. Es ist für die Gehirnströme, es ist ein, ein EKG, Puls, Blutdruck und hauptsächlich der galvanische Hautreflex, der ja ein, das beste Maß für die emotionelle Anteil beim Musikerleben übernimmt. Und es sind doch für die Medizin sehr interessante Dinge dabei herausgekommen. Wir haben angefangen an der Stelle, die parallel geht mit dem Siegfriedidil. Also eine im Grunde genommen sehr ruhig bewegte, äußerst leise Musik, allerdings von einem hohen Gefühlsgehalt. He would have loved to have met Albert Einstein. He admired people who thought in terms of the grand scheme of things. Es ist doch heute selbstverständlich, dass Musik eine Ausstrahlung über die ganze Welt gefunden hat, die wir uns nie haben träumen lassen vor äh, noch zu der Zeit, wo ich studiert habe. Das ist für uns alle ein großes Glück. Und ich sage, wenn so und so viele Millionen, äh, sagen wir, normale Menschen äh, die Musik als das hören und aus ihr so viel Glück und Freude schöpfen, ist es dann nicht eine Pflicht, sie denen zugänglich zu machen, die äh, nicht äh, normal sind, äh, desequilibriert sind, äh, schwach entwickelte Kinder. Und ich, ich glaube, es wäre ein, ein großer Dienst an der Menschheit, wenn man ihnen damit zumindest eine gewisse Sicherheit von innen heraus geben könnte. Das ist der eigentliche Sinn meiner Stiftung. Even today, autistic children are sometimes invited to rehearsals, such as this one for Richard Strauss's four last songs. On these occasions, Carrie-Anne used to recount his own childhood memories to the youngsters. He told them how he came to train as a percussionist and how that experience had a decisive influence on his sense of rhythm. He told them how the fiddler fled from the racket created by the drummer women and how he was simply left behind. Throughout the years, his mind was full of all kinds of interlinking memories and experiences.
Verstehen Sie, ich habe durch meine ganze Zeit immer das Gefühl gehabt, ich bin ein zurückgebliebenes Kind. Das ist durch viele Dinge äh, beeinflusst worden, dass man eben mich als den Zweitgeborenen immer den Bruder vorgestellt hat. Der ist groß und stark und ist klein und schwach. Und das hat mich natürlich wahnsinnig gemacht. Aber es ist mir in dem Weise geblieben, dass ich eben noch manchmal mich selbst als eigentlich als Kind sehe. He maintained close links with the Wiener Volkstheater, famed for its satirical humor. Für mich ist die Sache schon lang heraus. Das Astralfahrt des Sonnenzirkels ist in der goldenen Zahl des Orions von dem Sternbild des Planetensystems in das Universum der Parallaxe mittels des Fixsternquadranten in die Ellipse der Ekliptik geraten. Folge ich muss durch die Diagonale der Approximation. Bei den perpendikulären Zirkeln der nächste Komet die Welt zusammenstießen. <lacht> 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 die Fixstern-Songs sind alle auf an Fleck. Das ist ein Lob. Dann doch sind alle In Hamburg wechselt auch ein Stern den Ort. Dort geschieht das oft ganz ohne Grund geht's fort. Auch Bergmann und die Lolo Brigitta, die flimmern nur noch in Amerika. Ja, die großen Stern, die Trems bunt. Doch die Kleinen erst, die richten uns zu Grund. Ich meine so. So ein Tischler, so ein Spengler, so ein Installateur, die braucht man nur zu rufen, dann schauen sie gleich nicht her. Und wenn sie was anrühren, ist am nächsten Tag hin, dann schicken sie die Rechnung von Nizza noch hin. Jetzt haben sie auch noch Aktien im Strang. Aber die stehen an <laughs> He believed that the development of the classical Viennese school of music would have been unthinkable without this traditional melodic language, as heard here in Nestroy's popular Viennese dialect comedy, Lumpasi Vagabundus. Outside St. Moritz, he built himself a house where he could study scores in peace. Even during the holidays, his daily routine was strictly regulated, studying, walking, yoga exercises, swimming. He often invited small groups of musicians to record chamber pieces in the tiny woodland church, which he insulated with egg cartons and glass wool. The last great score he studied here was Richard Strauss's Alpine Symphony. He came upon the work late in life and, to understand it better, was often flown at dawn into the Bernina Alps. For Carianne, Every recording was like walking a tightrope. The aim was to reproduce the most intense concert experience under studio conditions. For him, most of the great works were a combination of light and darkness. He extended and explored the boundaries between the two without changing a single note. This recording of the Alpine Symphony was the first on CD. Carian himself had exerted considerable influence on this state-of-the-art technology. But the yardstick against which modifications were measured was always the live concert with an audience. <laughs> <laughs> 